So I'm going to talk about, like, well, let's do this. Okay, so in reality, a lot of, so I also um, have done like some consulting and then, then I moved to Microsoft and I, I don't have to actually solve the incidents there, which is awesome, um, but I still report them and kind of help them figure out what's happening. And um, a lot of places are not ready for this type of incident. They're like, I know what to do with ransomware, got that. Uh, I know what to do with malware. I can format machines, like no one's business. But then when it comes to like a weird software thing, like you've created a custom app and someone has broken into your app, people are like, what? What? I only, like there's, so I, I was looking for a playbook on this and I couldn't find one. So I'm like, I'm gonna write a talk about all of the weird ideas in my head of what I've been doing the past four or five years when I respond to incidents. And I hope that you like them. <laughs> Cause I, I made most of this up. Okay, so, um, Okay, what are we gonna talk about today? So we're gonna talk almost only about incident preparation, and then we're gonna talk about during an incident. Because ideally, if you have prepared really, really well for incidents, uh, you might not have them. Okay, so uh, this is me. Sometimes this is me, and I'm Tanya Janka. Uh, on the internet, I am she hacks purple, and yes, this it's purple at the end. Um, I'm a giant nerd, and I work for this little startup. You might have heard of us. We are called Microsoft. <laughs> uh, I have something called a, a senior cloud developer advocate, and I didn't know what that was either. So I made a slide about what it means. It means I do all of these things. I get feedback from the community. I do security research and release it for free. And basically, I want to learn what people actually want our stuff to do from a security perspective so it actually works, so then we can change it for you because, yeah. So I don't sell things, I'm just a giant nerd. And I consider myself an application security evangelist, but not like this guy, more like this guy. <laughs> yeah, and including the sparkles. And um, so I am a, a, like an ethical hacker, because I want to look inside. And um, I'm totally obsessed with OWASP, which is um, an international nonprofit organization, and I help run the chapter here in Ottawa with chapters all around the world. And all we want to do is just help everyone make more secure software. So, like, I have a project and I have a chapter, and I'm ridiculously obsessed. And I'll talk about them a lot. And if you don't like them, I don't know if we can be friends. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, I, I run the chapter, and then I have a project. And um, I just started a thing called Cyber Lady, so all the women in the room, you're invited. I have a meetup, and we just brunch like badasses. We crash boy meetups together. <laughs> we teach each other, give each other workshops, and it's like ladies only, so you're all invited. Just so you know, look us up on Meetup. And those are like our chapter in Israel. Those ladies are from Israel. Um, and so I have been coding for a really long time, and um, I have a goal for my career. Uh, which is why I do all these talks and like why I took this job and like why I work too much. I feel like it's way too hard to make software secure right now. I feel like the default way that we do things is insecure for everything, all technology. And I would like it if the default way to do anything, the easiest way to do the thing was the secure way. And right now that's not the way. So that is what I'm personally working on. But that is like a lot about me. And instead, I think we should talk about incident response. <laughs> okay, so first I'm gonna start with definitions. I'm sorry if some of this bores you a little bit, if you already like respond to incidents 24 seven and you know my silly lingo, um, but this will be over in like two minutes. Okay, so what is pushing left? So this is my favorite topic. So when we build software, we do this thing called the system development life cycle that looks like that. And if you do DevOps or Agile, you just do like littler circulars, like more circles, that's it. Um, but no matter what, you need to know what you're building, you need to map out what you're gonna build, you do a lot of coding, which I think is the fun part, you test it and you release it. The further left you look on this screen, see my awesome animations? I should have become an animator. Um, <laughs> uh, the further left you go, the earlier are you in the system development life cycle. So when I say pushing left, it's because like so many of the jobs I've had, I come in at the end when the software is already built, everything's done. 
right? So I want to try to push everyone to allow me to start earlier. I want to be there for requirements. I want to be there for design. And this is what all application security people want. We want to be invited to the original kickoff party for your project, and we want to be there the whole way through. So this is pushing left, so doing security from the start. OK, so now what is pushing right? Okay. This is what has happened at a lot of places that I have talked to, consulted at, et cetera. Uh, it's where you wait until the end to look at security, and then everything's on fire, and then you call me at 4 in the morning, and I'm like, who gave you my number? <laughs> um, and, and so if you wait until the end, it's not going to be pretty, right? When, if this is the first time you've looked at security, like, it's going to be bad. And so, Incidents are the most expensive, humiliating, and awful, damaging way to deal with security for the first time. Right? So yes, sometimes even if you do AppSec, you might have incidents at the end. But all the places that I've worked at that have great AppSec, very few incidents. Um, so yes, yeah, so uh, I will joke that places are like, oh, you're really pushing right with that, aren't you? Awesome. <laughs> um, and that's what I mean. It's like you're calling me in at the end. Why are you doing this? OK, so what is a security incident or a security event? Does anyone want to be super brave and put their hand up? Because if you do, if you answer one of my questions or you ask a question at the end, you get a maple candy. And I know we're in Ottawa, so this is way less exciting. But they're delicious, and they're my favorite candy. And I'm sure they cost a couple pennies. And so does anyone want to venture what's the difference between an incident or an event? Yeah. Amazing. That's like you, like you basically said my slides. <laughs> so security events when something strange happens, something has happened, but you don't know what's going on, or you think something's happening. But then an incident is when something has happened, and it's go time now. Um, we're clear. We're good. I know that you saw talks all day yesterday, and then you probably got wicked drunk at the party or the networking thing, and then now you're like, oh my god, it's morning. But I'm hoping you had like enough coffee so that you're like, yeah, let's do this. Because I, I have. I'm pumped. <laughs> OK, so <laughs> here is an example of a security incident. You find your data for sale on the dark web. <laughs> That's not an event. Something has happened. Poo. <laughs> 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 OK, so incident response. This is an organized response to when an incident happens. So this isn't like a free for all and we all run around like this, because that's what my first incident looked like. Because I had, had no training. I was just like, ah. So this is, it's organized. And you try to, first of all, like shut everything down, make sure everything's OK, stop whatever is happening from happening more. And then like you figure out the damage, you fix things, you brief effort management, get yelled at, and then everything's fine. <laughs> but, it's, but it's true. And you try especially to reduce the recovery time and the costs, and especially the costs to your reputation. Right? So sometimes something has happened, you're not sure how bad it is, and then like the media will jump to conclusions and be like, ah, this is happening, because like we all know the media doesn't like basically like you tweet a thing and then like everyone repeats it and it's fact now, even though it's like, but that guy doesn't even work there. Right? So <laughs> so you have to make media quotes and it, it's awful, trust me. Um, okay, so what is AppSec? What is application security, which I will refer to as AppSec because it's a lot of uh, syllables, and I say it a lot. OK, so it's every and any activity that you perform to ensure your software is secure. And I said that. Uh, I quote myself in talks a lot, because I feel like it looks more interesting. <laughs> and yeah, I do what I can. OK, so that's, what's, that's what it is. It's the security of software. right? It's like the things that you do to try to make sure your software is secure. And if you are, let's say you know, there's a function you used to use a lot. And then it's been found to be super vulnerable, like this third-party component. And you just grep through all your source code, looking for it and removing it. You are doing application security, right? If you are reviewing someone else's code to make sure that it's secure, that's application security. If you've hired a, a person like me to come in and like kick your app around, that's application security. All of those things are. If you're fixing security bugs, application security. Okay, so. Oh, yeah, 
I forgot. So I'm gonna like, like two, one, one, two more minutes. We have a whole hour. <laughs> okay, so application security is a thing. Poor AppSec causes 29 to 40% of breaches. So I say 29 because one year it was that and the other year it was 40%. This is, has anyone read the Verizon breach report? I read the summary. <laughs> um, basically, they take account of all of those things and number one every year has been software. People are breaking into software. It used to be networks and operating systems and then some of the people that make operating systems got their act together and made more secure operating systems and now the easiest way in is custom apps. Um, also, they don't really teach this in school yet and uh, I am doing some volunteer work for the government to try to help with that um, because like when we teach a software developer to code, we teach them, okay, so hello world, it goes out to the screen. Who here has done hello world? Right? The next thing they teach you is, okay, so let's read some, what is your name? And then the person puts it in and then you take it and then you put it onto the screen. So that is cross-site scripting right there. 100%, <laughs> the way they, tr they teach you is wrong every time. And so um, this is a big problem and uh, I'm working on it and yeah. Okay, so now let's talk about preparation. So this is gonna be the meat of the talk and I'm gonna go through like a whole bunch of different things that you can do to prepare so that you don't have an incident or at least when an incident does happen, you are this hot knife cutting through butter. You're like, I know what I'm doing, let's do this. And minimal damage, everything happens fast. Good resolutions. Resolutions where no one's yelling, yeah. Okay, so an ounce of prevention's worth a pound of cure. This is maybe even more exponential than that. Okay, so number one. <clears throat> so I'm gonna give you the most obvious advice ever. Does anyone wanna guess what this advice is? Mm. Okay, so that is really good, but that's not it. But you deserve, but he gets a candy. <laughs> oh my gosh, that guy gets a candy too. Come up and ask me after. Okay, the most, the most obvious advice ever for, for making sure that you don't have incidents, patch your servers and upgrade your frameworks. <laughs> is this difficult? Yes. I upgraded my framework, so I have this open source project. <clears throat> and of course I wrote it in .NET code, because I work for Microsoft. <clears throat> and I upgraded it from like one to two, and it was hard. <laughs> so I feel your pain. I broke all sorts of things, and then I had to fix them, and then it was fine, right? But my app was down a week, because it's my side project for fun. But you, you really need to. So um, keep your frameworks up to date. So if you, let's say um, you were using struts, which I'm really sorry for you in the first place. I'm sorry. But it, like going from 1.0 to 2 point whatever, that's, that's really hard. But if you're going from 2 to 2.1, that's a lot easier. And if you just keep current, you'll have a lot less obviously um, big, huge holes in your apps and your life will be better. Like I know in the short term it's really easy to not upgrade and like not patch things and not, but it's always easy to do a shitty job, right? Because that's what's happening, right? Like if you're like 20 things behind, it's like, well, they're like, we didn't have time. I'm like, Pfft. okay, next, patch your servers, please. Obvious, everyone, everyone agrees with this advice, but um, so there's me begging and then see, this is fine. It's not fine, <laughs> it's not fine. <laughs> And then it's not fine. So <laughs> this is my number one advice. And I know that this is really hard to do. And I know that some of you um, work for the government and you have someone else in charge of patching your servers who you don't have power over. And so, you know, I feel that pain because I used to work for the government. But also, you can still upgrade your frameworks. You, I believe you have the power to do that. And it's so worth it, it's so worth it. It's really great when like an old, a vulnerability comes in, like an old framework, I'm like, that's not me. Don't worry, like there's not an incident, there's not an event, there's nothing, right? Okay, so next, instant response for your organization. So who here has an instant response process and knows it? Like knows their role in it, their role, right? Because like if you're on the instant response team, you have a much bigger role than if you're a software developer. Good. I dream of the day where everyone puts their hand up. <laughs> Because even if you are not, like if you work in help desk, you have a role in instant response. And sometimes it's just call the security team, be like, this looks bad, right? And don't touch it. 
don't manage it yourself. Um, I worked somewhere once and we had an incident and I went over to this leader of this other team and I was like breathing fire on him. I was super pissed. I'm like, why did you do this? You erased all the evidence, blah, 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 blah. Why didn't you follow the process? He's like, we have an incident response process. And I was like, oh my God, it's me, it's my fault. I hadn't, I'd taken over for someone else and I had no idea that no one in all of IT knew what they were supposed to do if there was an incident. So someone from Help Desk tried really hard to manage it himself. He effed it up royally, but the point is, <laughs> but the point is like he was trying really hard because he didn't know what to do and he like did the valiant thing, right? But um, then I taught everyone, like I expect this from you, I expect that from you, I, I need this from you, right? And then everyone knew what to do. And then I got a lot more phone calls because people would report things and it was great and then we could fix them right away instead of when like all hell broke loose. Okay, so create an instant response process. Teach every person that you know, everyone. Um, train people what you expect from them. This is an important one, refresh once a year. I worked somewhere once, or no, I was called in somewhere to give training. They're consulting with me, should we, get tr should we have training? And I was like, when was the last time you gave them training? Like 2012, and it was 2016. And I'm like, so four years ago, you gave developers one course on security, and you've had no turnover, you've had no, no new employees, you feel the same things are valid now as were then, and they're like, oh. So keep once a year, it's good. Um, so everyone needs to know what to do if they suspect an incident, and everyone in IT has a role, even if it's please, just don't touch anything. Just don't touch anything and call us. Right? If you find uh, images that are clearly illegal and disturbing, don't touch anything. Just leave your computer and no, just go call right away. Don't look, Jesus. You can't unsee things, right? And that's not your job and you shouldn't have to deal with something awful like that. Um, okay, so uh, here are some resources for like specific incident response processes that you could theoretically use where you work if you don't have one. So you can like kind of copy theirs and then because it's smart to not reinvent the wheel. Copy something cool and then change it so it works for you. That's, that's what programming is, right? Like you just code for a little bit and they're like, I don't know how to do that. And then you go on Stack Overflow. <laughs> you take whatever the thing is that looks good, you paste it in, it compiles, you're like, score, I'm an awesome programmer. Okay. There's gonna be a bunch of parts where I give you resources so you might wanna take pictures, um, but all these slides are also on the internet. So you can already go get them and then there's gonna be a video of this at some point when they feel like releasing it. Um, okay, so training. So instant response teams are expensive. I feel they're, they're worth it if you need one. If you work somewhere and it's really little and you have 200 employees, your instant response team might be named Fred or Jen and that person just knows when they need to call someone bigger and they know how to format machines that have malware. And that's it, maybe that's all you need, right? But they need instant response training, they need forensics training. Um, I advise blue team exercises and red team exercises. Who here is blue team? If you are a defender, you're a blue team. If you, um, if you write code, you are probably blue team because whatever you write, you want it to not be insecure. Red team is when you attack things. So when I do security testing, I'm red team, which is why I call myself purple team. But most of us in IT are blue team, which is awesome because we need more defenders than attackers. But these exercises are so good to do with your incident response team so you can train them up nicely. Um, another thing is incident simulation. Uh, I used to work for Elections Canada, and I don't know if you know, but they do an entire election six months before the real one. They do a practice one. They build an office, they put all of the IT in it, they hire hackers to descend on it, they throw fake incidents in, and the staff have to act like it's real. And then they learn a ton, and then they fix things so that when the election happens, it's just smooth like butter, right? So incident simulations where you work are a great idea, just so you, people know what to do. Um, they need training and detection, they need to know about monitoring and all sorts of other things. Like, it's, the point is it's gonna be expensive. It's not gonna be super cheap. Um, if you are a very small place, again, you don't necessarily need your own incident response team, it's up to you. Okay, who here has used Nmap before? Yeah. 
Um, if you are in a traditional data center, okay, who here has a complete list of every single application that their company has made? <laughs> no hands, that's right. Because I, because I, <laughs> you're like elbow. <laughs> like we, we have half of them documented. Most of us don't, right? But a thing you can do is you can take Nmap, scan your perimeter, just scan the crap out of everything. Scan every single thing and look and see where your custom apps are. If port 443 or 80 are open, stuff's happening. Also, close port 80. <laughs> HTTPS only. <laughs> um, so Nmap is your friend. It's free. Uh, it's not that hard to use. Um, I've done it, you can do it, trust me. It, like if you're smart enough to work in IT, you can totally use Nmap. However, um, you wanna use it to create an inventory of all your apps. So this is like the first super application security thing. If you don't know where it is, how can you defend it, right? Caveat, if you are in the cloud, Nmap is unnecessary. So I work for a cloud provider, but we're all the same, like basically, and all of them, you can see everything that is in your subscription unless someone has taken their credit card and gone somewhere else and paid for cloud somewhere else so that it's not being paid for by you, everything should be in your subscription and then you have like a perfect view. There's just like a button, you're like, oh, show me my dashboard, and there's all your stuff. So this is not a thing you need to do if you're in the cloud. Um, however, if you have an employee that goes and takes their credit card and goes out and buys some stuff, that should not be allowed under your domain, right? So you should be switching domains as you go to it Right, so again, this is a thing where it should be like pretty obvious to you and your customers, like there's something's not right here. Um, try not to let your employees do that. Instead, actually like serve them. <laughs> Give them the things they need to do their jobs and they won't do that to you. Off topic, okay. So no matter what, you need application inventory. So you're gonna make an Excel spreadsheet that is the most uh, useful file of where you work as an incident responder. Because when an incident happens, if you, so someone's like, oh, you know, XYZ app is down. Oh, what the hell is that? Where is it? I don't even have a link to it. Who's in charge of it, right? You go to this and then you're like, oh. Like you can automate a thing to have just Nmap run every month or every week. It's up to you, right? But if you don't know where your stuff is and you don't know who's in charge of it, like you're already, you're super lost. I have had incidents where like, this thing is down. I'm like, does anyone know where that thing is or what it does? <laughs> Who's in charge of it? Who do I call? <laughs> that is not helpful at like, especially if it's late. Even 6 p.m., most people are gone, right? And you're like, I am in so much trouble right now. Um, so this is the most important step, I feel, besides patching all of your servers and everything. Okay, so you can't protect it if you don't know that you have it. So document your tech stack. Right? Um, how many people are using know every single thing in their tech stack? We made ours, so I know. <laughs> right? Most of us, like, I've worked places where they're like, oh, and then there's that team that just uses Ruby. I'm like, what? We're a Java shop. Why are, they're like, oh, they like it. <laughs> uh, oh, well then. <laughs> right? If you don't even know what you have, how can you protect against it? Because if you know that you have this one group that uses Ruby, then you know that you need to keep your eye on things regarding Ruby. So, all the programming languages you use, all the APIs that you call that aren't yours. Libraries, who here knows all of the components that are in all of their apps? Okay, no, I can't put my hand up for that one. <laughs> right, but you can document this. There's tools that'll do it for you. OWASP has one um, called Dependency Check, and it will scan your code, and it will tell you the list of all the libraries that you're using, and it will tell you which ones are vulnerable. Score what operating systems and what versions? Configuration settings. Who here is using infrastructure as code? If you do that, all your configurations can be in your code so then you don't really even have to document it because it's there. Two birds. Um, firewall rules. Not gonna get to, yes? Yes. Yes, you can automate your documentation with uh, infrastructure as code, and that is like such a huge bonus. Like it's already cool, but that makes it way better from a security auditing person sort of standpoint. I don't do audits, but I have to like report to people that do them sometimes, and like it, it's really painful if you don't know where anything is. So they don't like that. All your inputs and outputs and integrations with other systems. Seriously, I need you to know this. 
I know this seems crazy, but again, you're gonna add this all to this magical Excel spreadsheet that when an incident happens, you're gonna be like, this is the most valuable piece of paper I've ever had. Oh, and then this is OWASP dependency check. Okay, so you wanna stay informed about threats. Um, who here has a threat feed? Big companies usually pay for a threat feed. It's pretty sweet. If you work for the Canadian government, you already have one. It's called GC Cert. Read their emails and respond. <laughs> they're, they're, they're really good. I know people like to hate on SSC, but like, I think GC Cert's kind of awesome. They do a lot of good stuff for you. Um, oh, let's go back. I, I have an awesome SSC story. I had to call them because there's an incident that I couldn't manage. It was too big for me. It's like, I guess some people are like, was that hard on your ego? I'm like, no, I was like, oh my gosh, my hair is on fire, I need help. <laughs> right? I didn't even, it didn't even occur to me to be like, I can handle this, I'm whatever. And they were amazing. And they called in IT cert, and they were amazing. And we called a private company and paid them as much as my house costs. I don't know, I don't know how much we paid them, but it was more than I get paid. And um, IT cert and GC cert kicked their butt. They got us results faster, more accurate, it was great, and so if you work for the government, you have an awesome team behind you of people that really know what they're doing. And I know people really like to hate SSC, but hate them for the right reasons, and that's not one. <laughs> okay, so follow, so CSERC, again, a Canadian government thing, they have an RRS feed where they'll tell you about threats, and it's free for everyone. It's free for, it's made for Canadians, but everyone can use it. Um, review their bulletins and technical reports. There's a US cert. Uh, it's on the internet, which means you can still read it, right? If it's free, why not benefit? Um, Swamp in a box, which is like more advanced stuff. Eh, I don't use it, but it was suggested to me as a possible resource and you might wanna use it. And more threats. You can register to known software vendors. So if you use Oracle, register with them to get updates. Right? If you use um, Microsoft, if you use Apple, whatever the big names are that you're using, they probably have a feed. If you're a big customer, they'd be happy to send it to you. Um, listen to podcasts and monitor Twitter. Who here finds out about vulnerabilities on Twitter first? <laughs> That's actually why I joined Twitter. Um, because during WannaCry, I kept asking my friend, uh, Sh Shannon Leet, What's happening with WannaCry? She's like, I need you to grow up, Tanya, and act like an InfoSec adult and get Twitter. Like, yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, she was right, though. Um, sign up for security and update notifications for every product in your tech stack. Every single one. I know that it's like, oh, this is such crap span. But when it tells you, by the way, this, there's an exploit and it's in the wild and this is what it looks like, then you can do, I have some protections for you for zero days. Um, so monitor recent breaches of other companies and see if you can learn from it. So Equifax, that was a Struts 2 vulnerability. So if you are running Struts and you're running vulnerable versions, like learn from their mistake. Everyone's gonna make fun of your CISO for having a music degree instead of a, <laughs> an InfoSec degree. Um, also like millions of dollars of losses and personal information lost. So um, I try really hard to learn from others' mistakes so I don't make the same mistake. I want to make my own mistakes. <laughs> um, but, but seriously, all of these things are great resources and I suggest you sign up. Okay, next slide. Next top. Oh, anything else you can think of. Great. Okay, so, oh, cloud. I made more slides. So Countermeasure wanted to have some cloud. I'm like, I've got cloud. So <laughs> turn on threat protection. So every single cloud provider has like a lot of the same things and you can take advantage of them. So there's threat protection that will protect like databases, and it's just like, that looks bad, that looks bad. It's kind of like a WAF, but for your database. Um, turn on all your monitoring. Turn on every single security feature. So all of them have different security features, and you just like, whichever cloud you're using, just be like, flip, 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 flip. They tend to cost less than third-party security tools, because you will get a whole bunch of them from your cloud provider instead of like one from each different vendor. Um, yeah, so whatever security dashboard they offer, just turn it on and, oh yeah, add contact information, add a phone number. <laughs> so, uh, like, um, not to get too Microsoft-y on you, but I work there and we have like these recommendations in our cloud and it's now high alert if you don't have a phone number of someone they can call if like your cloud's on fire. 
like people don't put their phone number. I'm like, why would you not put your phone number? Oh my gosh, don't you want to call? If like literally it's like, oh, well, we're pretty sure you've made a lot of Bitcoin in the past hour. <laughs> Is that yours? Have you decided to do that pyramid scheme? Some of us were ranting last night about Bitcoin, like how we're using all this energy for nothing. And I'm going to zip it. OK, so this will only protect you against you AppSec issues. There's more AppSec issues, but these things can help. It's not going to do complete coverage. It's not like a WAF. Oh, I'm going to get to what a WAF is. Get a WAF. <laughs> okay, so what is a WAF? Um, it is a firewall, but at the application level instead of the networking level. Right? So everything that comes in to your app, it looks at it, the requests and responses, things going in, things going out. It's like, that doesn't look right. So if something comes in and it's like, um, you know, like single tick or equals or one equals one, <laughs> that might be an SQL injection. It is. Um, and then this would look at it and go, no, no. So OWASP makes one. I know I said I'd talk about them a lot. That's free security. And then it has rules called the core rule set. So the WAF is separate than the rules. You don't have to implement the rule if you don't want to. I know everyone here is like, why would you implement a WAF and then not implement the rules? If you don't have professionals to run the rules, because running the rules can be complex, um, you can just have a WAF for the sole reason that when um, a zero day is happening and it's being exploited in the wild, you can create a custom signature. You can create one rule for that. So in the instance of Struts 2, if you already have a WAF, you're like, okay, I just need a copy of the exploit. And then anything that looks remotely like this, just block. And then you now have six months to upgrade your framework instead of six hours. Right? So I feel everyone should have a WAF for that one reason. And since you can have a free one, it's pretty good. Um, so that's a web application firewall. And okay, so what is it? Oh, uh, yeah, I guess I said this there. But I like this. That's what a WAF is. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a shield. It's literally a shield. Everything has to go through it or not. And it's like, nope, nope. Um, it's really helpful. Okay, so enterprise security. That's not what this talk is about. So this talk is about software security, and I'm skipping a lot of things. And you're probably going to be like, oh, but she's not talking about firewalls and admin rights and all of these things that the security team likes to do to you. I'm not talking about those on purpose, because otherwise this would be a one-day training. <laughs> and so I'm skipping it on purpose, because sometimes people are like, but you skipped this. So I'm just telling you, like, that's on purpose. OK, so backups and rollbacks. So who, who here does regular backups? Yeah, yeah. Who here does practices rollbacks? Oh, less hands. Good job. Oh, did you just put your elbow up? No. <laughs> um, I worked somewhere once, and a big bad thing happened. And then I said, OK, well, let's do, let's do a rollback. Oh my gosh. They, they're like, oh, well, it's going to take us about a week to get a copy of the backup. And it'll take us three to four days to figure out how to do it. I'm like, well, we've lost one day's work for our entire company. And they're like, we suggest you redo it. I'm like, can we fire all of them now? Like, <laughs> no, no, but seriously, like your job, your one job, like there, there was like a backup team. I'm like, so practice your backups. Practice back. Seriously, being able to roll back is key. So I worked at another place, and I remember, I, like, I was a programmer. I'm all happy I'm coding. And then I'd send, like, scripts to the DBA, and they're like, where's your rollback script? And I was like, I don't need one of those. It's perfect. I'm a programmer. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, uh, no, we require a rollback script for everything now. And then we're going to do it in test, and then we're going to roll it back. And if it doesn't look the exact same after, then you have, to, you have to start again. I was like, why are they doing this to me? But now that I work in security, I'm like, brilliant. right? So if they put it in and something goes bad, they can roll it back. I know that this is extra work. But it, like, you can do things half-assed, and you, those are the results you will get. right? And us ha losing a complete day of work, and then the backup team telling us, like, if we worked all night for three days, maybe we could have it back then. It's like, oh, well, never mind. Right? It's not worth it. I'm sure all of you have lost things at some point. Who here does backups at home? Awesome. Who here encrypts those backups? 
who here keeps the disk directly next to their computer so if robbers come in, they'll get your disk and your computer? Yeah. <laughs> so many people are like, their backup's like right on top of their computer. I'm like, put it in the linen closet. Put it in the kitchen somewhere. Put it somewhere else when you're not backing up. Yeah, yeah, it's actively plugged in. And I totally get it because I used to do that until I worked in security and was like, oh, <laughs> what am I worried about? Like a flood or a robber? I'm like, oh, a flood or a robber if it's right on top. Oh, Tanya. <laughs> um, but if you do it on the cloud as well, then you're okay. Okay, so backups and rollbacks. Investigation tools. You need tools not during the incident, you need them before. You need to know how to do them, how to use them, what they do, and they need to work with your system. So you can't be like, oh, I have the install files, I'll install it later. You have to like use it and make sure it can reach your app. So I've worked places where it's an incident and they're like, great, here's Nessus. I'm like, great, I'm gonna scan it. Oh, I am on a different environment and it can't reach that environment and there's like 20,000 firewalls in between us and all the firewall people went home for the day. So I can't scan to see if we're vulnerable to that, I'm sorry. We're like, am I allowed over there? They're like, oh, this guy's gone home. She's not, I'm like, ah. So investigation tools, you need to see what's happening. Metasploit, so I don't generally hang out with Metasploit, but if there is an exploit that is live right now that's out and there's no patch for it, you can get a copy of it by going on the web and doing lots of searching. And then you can make your own module for it and then you can test your app in a safe place, right? So in a safe environment for testing. Um, Nessus, Nexpose, open VAS for testing operating systems. Don't use them to test, don't use them to test your app. <laughs> Burp Suite Pro and OWASP Zap. One is almost free, one is free compared to other web app scanning tools. So if someone tells me like, oh, this app has cross-site scripting in it, and like if I haven't looked at it yet, because I've worked at places where they have 2,000 apps and then they hire me and then I'm like, okay, so I've looked at three now, right? <laughs> so there's one in there that has this. I'm like, great, can I go look at it? Can I examine it? You need to have these tools. Log viewing software. Who here has ever looked at web server logs? Who here has tried to open them in Notepad and been disappointed? <laughs> So you need log viewing software. <laughs> okay, don't forget training and access. It's so important that you actually train the team how to use it, and you can't just train Tanya. I mean, one person. You have to train more than just me. Um, you, like, you always have to have a backup person because people go on vacation and all of these things. And although like, I have a bit of an ego and it's like super exciting that people are helpless without me, that's not the right, it's not the right decision. Right? A lot of places have an IT person that is like me, where it's like, yeah, that's right, you can't live without me. <laughs> and I know it's a bad attitude, and I've worked on it, but when I was young, I was really bad for that. I was like, I know how to do everything. No one else knows how to do anything. Yeah! <laughs> um, but what you want is, like, the perfect employee actually trains all the other people so they know what they're doing. Right? Um, okay. So if you use the cloud, it's slightly different. Do I have, oh wait, no, okay, I don't have a slide for that. Okay, so if you use the cloud, it's slightly different. So you don't need Nessus, Nexpose, or OpenVAS because all of that is built into your cloud. I'm not just speaking for mine, all of them are the same. <laughs> like, we're all just copying each other, in case you haven't noticed. <laughs> it's like, oh, that was a great idea, let's do it, name it something else. But it's because, you know, you want it to be awesome. So, Metasploit, yes. Nextpose, next, you don't need that, the cloud will do it. Burp Suite and OWASP Zap, yes, but also they're starting to roll out like web app scanners in the clouds. All the clouds are starting to get them. And by that I mean they're buying cool ones and then putting them in. Um, log viewing software, you don't need that because that's built in. And training and access, you definitely need that. You definitely need that. Um, if people can't see, they can't see. And all the same role-based authentication and all of that still exists in the cloud. And if anything, it's like worse because it's like it goes down like this, and like there's no oh, and then we just racked the server over here. Like everything is in line. Okay, so what should you log? Who wants to who wants to name like a couple things that you should log? I got candy. Come on. <laughs> no. Okay, I'm gonna tell you the answer. That's fine. That's fine. I know you're you're like she has a lot of candy up there. I can get one later. Okay, so if you didn't log it, did it even happen? If you don't log things, I am screwed. 
right? Like, I've worked places and they're like, oh, like so many apps, they don't do any logging. I'm supposed to know what happened. I'm like reading the stuff on the server and it's like, I don't know. Okay, so if you write custom apps, they need to do logging. Who? So which system or user executed this event? What? What happened? Right, is it just an exception? Is it like a database exception? What happened? Even if you just hint what happened. When, date, uh, timestamp, where? So which part of the app did it happen in? Yes? Yeah. Those. It's a security question. I think you should advise them on it. Yeah. I think anything that crashes, any exceptions, log it. Anything suspicious looking from a security perspective that you would want to know, log it. And then ask them what their, what their app does. And then ask them more questions. Like, when you, do you do threat modeling? When you do threat modeling with them, they'll tell you what's important to them, right? So what keeps you up at night? Why is this app, like, if something goes wrong with this app, what is the worst thing that can happen? Right? What is the thing that would go wrong with your app that makes you freak out, right? And when you talk to the business, there's probably different answers than the security team or the developers have. Cool. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if a security control fails, you definitely log it. Like if someone tries to log in 50 times in one second, <laughs> that's probably bad. If anything to do with a security control within your application, like encryption, things like that, privilege role-based stuff, definitely. Yeah. Oh, okay, I have to hurry. Okay, so do not log sensitive information such as passwords. Logs need to be saved to a different server than your app, preferably consumable by the sim. So we're like way behind. Sorry, guys. Okay, access. Don't make me ask you at 4 a.m. for access. Database logs. Web server logs, source code. Credentials, log viewer software. I don't want to ask at 4 a.m. for that. No one's up. Code review software. A safe place for me to destroy things. <laughs> I mean, run exploits. Um, every single thing on the tools slide. You have to have access before the incident happens because it is so stressful to be like, oh no, I don't have that. Um, schedule fire drills to test access every three months. I know that sounds boring, but I love it when an incident turns out boring because I just fix it and then everything's fine. Okay, so disaster recovery. We're way behind, I'm sorry everyone. Who here has a disaster recovery plan? Awesome. Who here has a business continuity plan? Yeah, you need one. You really do, even if you're a small place. So business continuity plan. So what are the risks and how can you continue if this app fails? Backup locations, cold, warm, or hot. So at the cloud, that's really easy. There's literally a button. I want my backups to be geographically located somewhere else. But with a traditional data center, this can be quite complicated and expensive. What if critical infrastructure goes down? What if all the power in your city goes down? Do you have a plan? Cell phones, landlines. I worked somewhere once, and their plan was paper. <laughs> they had, they were so, so they had like a computer system to report some results, and then they had cell phones, and then they had landlines, then they had, um, what are those, satellite phones, and then they're like, if not, we'll do it on paper. We got this. The results will be a little late. Canada Post won't fail us. I'm like, I'm so impressed. 
And they thought about this because it was very important that all the science went where it was supposed to be. The cloud can do stuff. Isn't that a great line? So <laughs> the cloud can do a lot of this for you, all the clouds, not just ours. Um, it's literally a button. Graphically locate that somewhere else, please. <laughs> and, it, and it can do all sorts of crazy backup options for you. All the cost money, though. Incident simulation. I believe that we should practice for incidents way in advance, way in advance. Um, oh, oops. OK, I guess that's it. OK, so at least once per year, I feel that you should like simulate an incident. Let everyone know you're simulating it. And then see what help desk does. See what the managers do. See if the person reports it to you like they're supposed to, or if they try to do it themselves. If people do things wrong, you know you need to give training again. Scan everything ever. All your apps and all your servers. Scan all the things. Automate scans. Get reports back. I know they're not perfect and they miss things, but damn, they get a lot of things. Right? Then beg people to fix those things. This is back to the first advice of patch all your servers and upgrade all your frameworks. But seriously, when you scan, you'll see things were missing. You'll see things that you thought you had up to date but weren't. Scans double check all of your work. OK, so this is not about an AppSec program. So ideally, you would have a good AppSec program, so you have way less incidences. So you would do all of those things and more. That's all I like to talk about, usually. So you're welcome for talking about a different topic. <laughs> um, so I like talking about this anytime. Talk to me. OK, so during an incident, this part is fast, and then we'll go to questions. OK, so during an incident, what now? Six steps. And this is according to Sands. Who here saw my friend Terry's talk yesterday? It was awesome. Um, it was very cloudy. And she, oh, she's a Sands instructor. I'm like, that doesn't make sense why I referenced you. OK, so <laughs> number one, preparation and triage. What is happening, right? Assign an incident manager. Everyone needs to know who the incident manager is. Go figure out what's happening. Two, identification. What is happening? What is happening? Usually I'm like, okay, team, this thing appears to have happened. You'll have like 14 minutes to run off and go figure some stuff out, come back, and then we're going to meet at this time. I don't care if you're halfway through something, you come back. We're not going to wait for you. Tell us what's going on. And then you have a much better picture because sometimes someone's stuck and they're like, oh, I need another hour. I'm like, I don't care. Come back. If you're stuck, maybe this person can help you, right? I don't know if you're not telling me. Contain it, containment. So there's short term and long term. So for short term, Oops. For short term, first of all, make sure the bleeding is done. Right? Is someone actually infl uh, exfiltrating data right now? If so, ugh, you need to stop that. Right? But then there's long term containment. You want to make sure like, you repair everything and fix everything. And eradication. You need to make sure no one's on your network. You need to make sure no one's in your app. You probably need to go change a whole lot of passwords. Right? Or if there's ports open, whatever it is, you need to make sure that like you are now bulletproof from that from that instance or from that attack, whatever it is that happened. So this cannot happen to you again. And then recovery. So that's where you clean up. I usually don't have to do that part. <laughs> usually like developers have to do it. <laughs> thank you. And ops people, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, basically repair the damage, restore the systems, make sure business is back online, everyone's doing all of their stuff, and then post-mortem. I believe this is the most important part. So you, everything's done, ever, everyone has gone home and slept, and then you come back while it's fresh in your mind, and you have a meeting with every single person involved that was part of that incident, and you talk about it, and you make notes, and you're, you pay attention, because next time, you might have similar problems. Um, I like to, so like I'm obsessed with data and metrics. I love measuring stuff. So I worked somewhere once and I took all of our incidents and then I classified them and then it turned out 26% of them had to deal with AppSec. And then I used that data to convince them to let me launch an AppSec program, which was awesome. I was like, we have five types of incidents. Two of them are completely unavoidable. And then these three are avoidable. So let me make a plan for you to fix all three of them. Right? This is stuff that you can do so that you don't have more incidents. Or at least, if some, like if I don't want someone to do a silly SQL injection 
on me. I don't want to be simple. If someone is gonna hack one of my apps, I want it to be like the most difficult thing they've ever done, <laughs> right? Um, and I feel, I feel that's really important. And es especially um, like small businesses, you don't need to be like, you don't need to assume China's coming after you because they're very advanced. They really know what they're doing, right? But you do need to make sure that like the kid next door who like is just learning how to code or like watched a video at DEF CON isn't going to be able to get into your app. Everyone should have that level of security, I feel. Okay, now, um, so Microsoft posts all of our big incidents online. We like to show our underwear. This is a thing we do, we call it dog food. And we share the details of what happened to us to show we're not perfect so other people can learn from it and you can see we're working our butts off at it. If you wanna read about our incidents, like all of the big ones go there, even when it's bad. Um, I, yeah, okay, so conclusion. Thanks for sticking with me the whole time. Uh, AppSec is really hard. I feel like application security is the new frontier in security specifically, because we're getting really good at enterprise security, we're getting really good at network and perimeter security, and we still kind of stink at AppSec. And I think that this is a topic that people really need to pay attention to. And if you prepare for an AppSec incident, you will be so happy later, because one will eventually happen to you, because that is the thing right now. That is what hackers are learning how to do. They're less about memorizing things about operating systems and more about using Burp Suite, looking at your app and seeing what they can do to you. And with that, I'd like to give you a couple of resources. So I was going to list like a million things about incident response and then I just instead suggest you use your favorite search engine, this is mine, to look for incident response cheats, right? There's so many great ideas on the internet and you should steal all of them. <laughs> and Okay, so if you are interested in learning about software security, I have compiled, so this is a blog post I wrote, and I update it regularly, of different application security resources that I used or I wrote that are all free to learn about the security of software. And I think cameras are down, and I would shamelessly like to ask you to follow me, because these are the topics I talk about all the time. I have a live show every Sunday on Twitch and Mixer, save our shows to YouTube, I have a blog, I'm a giant nerd, this is all I do. And if you wanna know more about this, I really wanna teach you. And with that, oh, should I, should I, I'll just go back to the, I'll just leave it on this one, and I'll just say thank you for your time and attention today.